So welcome, guys, and, uh, and welcome, everyone. It's so good to uh, have you here today. It's amazing. Wow. So I was thinking, what would I say to an emerging uh, group of leaders around our movement and so on? Yeah. And I know there's various ages here, and, uh, and in some ways, we're all emerging. Yeah. We're all emerging out of something and into something. And so yeah. there, there are many things that I would say, but I was trying to, in terms of the context of church life, what would I say? And, and, and the first, uh, it's probably two questions right. that I would ask uh, and ask you. And, it's, and the two questions about what are you convinced about? Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's your level of conviction on something right. yeah. that keeps you going, yeah. that gets you up in the morning, yeah. because it's not really just how well you start or how excited you are at the beginning of something, yeah. but how you travel through that journey and ultimately how you end. So the, the first question is, are you convinced about God's answer, which wow. is the church? Wow. Are you convinced about that? Yeah. Because God has no plan B. Yeah. He's only got plan A. Yeah. <laughs> and as imperfect as the church is, as, as, as imperfect as we are, because the moment you and I walked into that church... Things went downhill. <laughs> well, sorry, when I walked into the church, <laughs> things on. went downhill. Yeah. You know, and there's this is weird thing. Like people are looking for this perfect church and yeah. you know the perfect pastor. And I'm sure you've yeah. seen those funny videos. You know, the, the church search yeah. thing. You know, is it, <laughs> is it should it be two holes in the jeans or one hole in the jeans? <laughs> I sewed this up, so I've got no holes in the jeans. <laughs> so God has no plan A. Absolutely, <laughs> He's got plan A. <laughs> God help us. <laughs> God has no plan B. Right. Only yeah. plan A. Yeah. So, so are you convinced about that? Yeah. Are you convinced the church is the answer? Right. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Yeah. And you can't just be convinced emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just be convinced like, well, that's a great idea back then when the Lord spoke to me about doing something. Yeah. I believe our convictions have to be born more than just in emotions, but born in Scripture. Yeah. And we need, we need a revelation of, of Scripture and, and see the church in Scripture. Yes. Uh, the great qu quote, it says, Large or small, mega or micro, traditional, radical, denominational, independent, multi-site or daughter churches, all the experts yeah. say mm. that establishing new churches is the single most effective way to spread the gospel of oh. Jesus Christ to, be yeah. to a broken world. Amen. However, but there isn't enough church planting going on out there. Yeah. Wow. So I, I'm, I'm putting a challenge out to us yeah. that if you want to be an emerging leader, it's not like, yeah, I, I, I've got a call, I've got this. Really, we have to focus it back in on churches and the expansion of the church and the starting of new congregations. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's challenging it's, and, and it's not easy and there's some things around that 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 we're going to talk about over the next uh, little while to, to help us understand what that actually means. Right. Because every church that starts is like a gate of heaven yeah. to that community. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. It's like, and as little or seemingly insignificant that that little tiny seed of a church plant, whether a church plant or location plant, Whatever, whether it's in the very northern tip of Australia, whether it's a big city like Melbourne or overseas in some city or country, the moment that couple or team arrive in that community yeah. with the call of God on them, on. Yeah. it's like heaven opened. Yeah. Yeah. Now, maybe just a little bit. Yeah. And, and the pressure on you to survive, to keep going, because it's almost like that little snippet of heaven, that little open heaven. Because, yeah. you know, the scripture in Genesis, Revelation of Jacob, says this is none other than the house of God. Yeah. This is the gate of heaven. Yeah. And the gate is not outside the house. The gate is in the house. And so it's when you build that house, it's the house of God, that, that gate is inside that house and, and it gives access for people to come to the knowledge of Christ. It's, it's the access for the gospel. It's the, the presence of God. It's now got a, a funnel into that community for the first time maybe uh, or definitely in a new way, the things that you bring. So, so we've got to be convinced about that and understand how powerful it is 
when, when each church starts. No wonder there's so much attack and so much warfare when it comes around uh, you starting something. And if, you, if you're going to be a church planner or a location starter, uh, you, you better be prepared for, for opposition and, yeah. and warfare and not in some paranoid uh, looking for devils uh, in, in, under every rug, but certainly be aware that you need to be equipped and prepared yeah. uh, and strong to handle that, which we'll yeah. talk about in a second. So right. because we can't separate the vision of reaching cities from the imperative of, of raising leaders. Wow. You can't yeah. separate the two. That, that, mm. that it isn't just the people that are doing it now starting more churches. No, as, as we have the vision to start more locations, whatever shape or form they take. Yeah. By the way, there isn't one model. Yeah. And what I love about C3 is that there are various ways to do this. You know, we've got 13 regions. We've now got 540 locations around the world. We've got 110,000 people reaching. But, wow. And people say to me, how do you plan a church? How do you start a location? And I say, well, I can give you 540 ways to do it. Because <laughs> 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 it's not about the model or the pattern. It's about the vision and the person yeah. and what God has called, which we'll talk Hello. about shortly. Uh, the early church was forced into expansion yeah. through persecution. Yeah. Yeah. I believe we need to not wait to be forced yeah. for whatever, whatever that looks like, whether it's socio-politically or spiritually. Let's not wait to be forced yeah. to spread, but yeah. let's expand by intention. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's expand because we feel called to and to do it and, yeah. and, and to enlarge uh, our, our hearts and our yeah. ability to reach communities yeah. through that process. So let's get intentional about this thing. Right. Yeah. And I know that's my job. Yeah. I want to I be intentional about what we're doing. I love the scripture in Isaiah chapter 54. Uh, you've heard me quote it many times and, and the reason we quote it, it's one of our core verses as a movement. Yeah. Pastor Phil has used it many, many times as a core verse. And it's interesting how, how verses that become revelation to you either personally or as a church never go away. In fact, they, they re-emerge in new yeah. ways. And I think Isaiah 54 uh, verses 2 and 3 ha has re-emerged and I know for me, as I looked at it in a new way, and I'll read it to you, enlarge the place of your tent. Interesting, it doesn't say enlarge your tent. It says enlarge the place of your tent. God yeah. is calling us to not just get bigger churches, but to enlarge the footprint. Yeah. Because because really the kingdom of God and influence around in our cities is about, about a f enlarging the footprint. And yeah. we'll hear later on uh, and in other contexts about uh, multi-site and what have you. And what multi-site ultimately is, and we're not talking about that specifically in this session, but what multi-site is, is expansion, not just vertically, but expansion laterally. Yeah. And as we extend laterally, in other words, you know, Joshua 1 verse 6, it says, wherever you place the sole of your feet. In other yeah. words, as we take more territory, as we yeah. have more locations, and maybe they won't be huge locations. It doesn't really matter. The fact is that you are taking territory yeah. geographically, yeah. generationally, yes. culturally, yes. what have you. And in each place that you extend out to, you're, ex you're enlarging laterally or in that direction. So, Because I believe that sometimes... The growth, uh, traditionally, we've seen growth vertically. We've got to keep building the size of our church. Yeah. But maybe God has called us to extend laterally. So yeah. as we expand laterally, we'll grow in terms of numbers and increase and influence and reach. It's more about reach yeah. than it is saying, wow, I've got a big church. Right. It's more about how many people yeah. at the end of the day oh, are we reaching. And in order to do that, we've got to have more leaders. Right. And, and we've got to see church differently and approach it differently. Yes. Which is, uh, which is a great thing. So, and then it goes on and says, uh, let uh, the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Don't hold back. Yeah. Don't hold back. I love that. Lengthen your cords. As we, as we grow laterally, yeah. the, the distance in our relationships has to be allowed to get longer. Yeah. When Bernie and I moved to New York, Many, many years ago, I think it's coming up to almost 30 years ago now. We don't live there anymore, but uh, we, we, we're back over 20 years now. But when we moved over there, the cord between us and Pastor Phil was no longer 10 metres, but it was 10,000 kilometres. And we've got to allow, but our relation, and we, there was no internet, no email, no, no nothing really. Uh, there was snail mail, that was it. And I would talk to Pastor Phil maybe twice a year. Wow. 
maybe twice a year. But and it's about the spirit of relationships. And as we grow and expand, now that isn't the case now because we have connections and we have uh, social media and we have FaceTime and we have, there's so many ways to connect. But it's more about the heart and spirit of relationship yeah. that even if there's distance, then we can trust, one, trust the foundation of a relationship and, and reflect the heart and spirit and culture of our leaders, yeah. whether, you're, whether you're a mile down the road or, or, or a thousand miles yeah. overseas. So, so lengthen the cords, strengthen the stakes. The, the stakes represent those core principles, those core values, the things we've believed in for years. As we grow laterally, we've got to strengthen our core again. And yeah. what is it? It's prayer. It's the Word. It's faith. It's, yeah. it's Holy Spirit. It's leadership. Yeah. Just remind ourselves of those core things again. Yeah. Get, drive those stakes. Yeah. Get that sledgehammer around and drive those yeah. stakes in. Yeah. And, I'm, and I've noticed even sometimes new generation guys. I was talking to a young guy recently and and he was questioning things and cynical about things. And it's okay to question, by the way, because I think it's, you know, that's the privilege of younger people, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and I question things, but, but not to a point of cynicism. No. Right. Not to a point where you question the basics. Yeah. And I'm like, your life is short. Yeah. You could spend the next five years trying to figure it all out and then, then it'd be too late to do anything yeah. for God. I think we need to be to need to believe in those in the basics again. Yeah. Maybe question the non-core things. Yeah. Uh, but if you even are questioning the core things, so resolve it, get on with it, and yeah. so let's begin to really the core is not about my theology or my latest thought or my latest thing, but right. but understanding that there's a lost world out there to be reached. Yes. Yes. And I need to be part of that, which, yeah, which yeah. is awesome. So, you know, drive those stakes back into the ground. Understand what the core things it is that both biblically and culturally that we believe in. And it yeah. says, for you will spread abroad to the right yeah. and to the left. That's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Wow. So as we yeah. spread, our, our, we will people cities. Yeah. I love that. It doesn't say we will reach cities. We will people cities. In other words... It is the people of our heart, our culture. We will, we will cause transformation into, yeah. into communities and into cities as we yeah. people them, yeah. uh, which, which was, is an awesome thing. I love the fact that and it says we'll spread abroad to the right and to the left. I believe we reach every political landscape. We, yeah. uh, interesting that it's, we're not called to a certain genre, socio-politically, what have you, we are called to all people. The church is meant to reach everyone, yes. uh, which, is, right. which is an awesome thing. Right. So uh, now the, the next question is, um, what sort of leader can this, uh, d- d- achieves this? What, what's the type of leadership qualities that, that achieves what I've just talked about? There's a, a great scripture I've, I've reread recently in, in uh, Joshua chapter 1, and it says this, Be strong and very courageous. This is obviously the Lord speaking to Joshua. If you're going to get a word from the Lord, you might as well get it directly from the Lord. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he, had, he had a pretty big mission ahead of him. Yeah. And he said, I read to him, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. There it is again. I'll come back to that. That you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Wow. Then you'll be prosperous, successful. And he repeats, have I not commanded you? Yeah, come on. This is scary when the Lord has to repeat this phrase, <laughs> be strong and very courageous. Why is he saying that? Because he's got to be strong and very yeah. courageous. Yeah. Uh, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. A couple of thoughts on this is um, five qualities of a leader. I believe we're meant to be leaders who are full of strength and courage. If, if we're going to do this, yeah. if, you, if, if we're going to be the sort of people that accomplish what I've talked about, uh, you have to be strong and courageous. Yeah. And what does that mean? Well, we could unpackage that, but you basically don't give up. Yeah. Yeah. Don't whip out on me. <laughs> yeah, come on. Uh, it's wonderful theory and principle to talk about strength and courage until you don't feel like being strong and courageous. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Secondly, it's interesting. He says, follow what... Moses, your leader told you, obey what your previous leader said to you. I believe we need to be humble followers as well as courageous leaders. We need, we need yeah. to be willing to take directions. Yeah. Yeah. 
We're not independent. We're not one generation. We're multi-generational. Right. We've got leaders. We've got followers. We've got team. We need to be able to take directives yeah. and, and flow with directives and flow with our leaders, which is important. Yeah. Also, thirdly, don't turn your attention to humanistic philosophies. Interesting. Do not. That, how's this? Isaiah 54 says, You will spread to the right and to the left. But the Lord said to Joshua, Do not turn to the right or to the left. Wow. So in other words, we're going to reach people to the right and to the left, but don't turn your attention to the right or to the left. Because it's easy to get your eyes off the Scripture, off the Word of God, and go and turn into humanistic philosophies. The answer is over here. Trust me, the answer is not over there. It's not in that that political or philosophical or socio-philosophical, I'll get it out, uh, direction. It is the Word of God is where the answers are. Now, I believe we need to be aware of those things. We need to be well read, but do not turn that way. Number four, speak, think and act on the word of God. And number five, in the midst of fear, overcome it anyway. In the midst of fear, overcome it anyway. Uh, So we all will get afraid. Trust me. I'm afraid right now. (laughs) (laughs) I I woke up this morning feeling a little like, oh, they're going to film me. (laughs) But... Do it afraid. Yeah. Do it afraid. Oh, Do it afraid. Right. Okay, second question. Just in the next few moments we're up together. Are you convinced about God's current perspective of the church? So we just yeah. t- talked about are, are we convinced about the church, yes. but are we convinced about God's current perspective of the church? But by the way, the gospel message never changes, yeah. but his perspective on it changes. Yeah. His, the model of it, the, 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 way, the way church is, the way yeah. it should express itself in the community. Mm. I mean, if we were to transplant church 1982 to now, we'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> we don't do church the same. Yeah. Does that mean church has changed? Well, it has. The message hasn't changed, yeah. but the way we do church has changed. My question to you is, are you convinced about that? Yeah. And do you know how to discover that? Yeah. Do you know the access points into discovering what that is? Here's a couple of thoughts for you. Right. I believe that three things that each effective church needs to be. Number one, it needs to be God's church. Yeah. I know that sounds obvious, but trust me, it needs to be God's church. Otherwise, it's unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. Not some weird diversion or interpretation yeah. of what you think God's church is. No, it needs to be God's church. Do the basics well. Theologically strong, practically strong. Yeah. And the basics, you know, the four pillars, you know, great weekend services, great small groups. Yeah. Great team building, great leadership pipelines. Just do the basics really well. Don't try and divert out of that. You know, I've heard people say, I've got a new way of doing church and I've got some clever thing. No, don't do your new way of doing church. Yeah, Yeah, we're going to do it at two in the morning because, you know... (laughs) Now, it's fine to be creative. And, and I, you know, I heard, of, I heard of a church recently. It's a church in the States that, that is in a city that has a lot of musicians in it. And all the musicians travel on the weekend. So their main service is on Tuesday night. Wow. Smart move. Yeah. They have a Sunday morning service. They've got 300 people in their Sunday morning service and 1,200 on Tuesday night. Wow. So, so it's, it's, it's flexible, but do the basics well. But let me, let me encourage you. Know what the basics are. Yeah. Study them. Research them. Visit places. Yeah. Study Highlands and, and, and read stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to, to things all the time, absorbing. Yeah. Do I take it all on board? No, but become an expert yeah. in, in the foundational basics of what healthy church is. Yeah. By the way, you have access to it. It's so easy to get into this stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And don't be gullible, but be well-researched and understand what right. God is. Okay, secondly... What is the second thing? Okay, God's church. The second thing the church is, is the church in you. Yeah. As, as general and as basic and as foundational as every church should be, there's also a church in you. There's the church that God specifically has asked you to build. Right. Yeah. you got to figure that one out. Yeah. And that's a journey. What is that church? What does it look like? Yeah. Uh, because otherwise it will be ineffective. And often we're copying other people's version yeah. and we go, well, you know, that church is doing great over there. Let's cut and paste. God is not a cut and paste. He's cut and paste in terms of the basics, but not cut and paste in terms of the yeah. core church that God wants you, you to build. Right. Thirdly, it's the New Day Church. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the magic, dare I use that phrase, 
is it's the combination of all three. Wow. It's God's church. Yeah. It's the church in you. And it's new day. Now, when I say new day, I'm not talking about contemporary. Yeah. You know, I see a lot of contemporary churches that aren't effective. Yeah. It's not about being trendy. It's the, ch- the new day church. There's, there's emphases around the world that God, and it's God's spirit that's moving it. And yeah. learn to hear the sound of the rustling of God's wind in the trees of the house of God. Yeah. And, and it's saying, worship, there's a sound in worship. There's a sound in leadership. Learn to yeah. hear that and interpret it through your context. New Day Church. Okay. There's a, what, is, what could that look like? Well, here's, here's 10 current trends. I'm going to just go through these really quickly. For example, for example, there's just current trends. There's a shift from attendance to discipleship. Are you aware of that? Uh, uh, secondly, there's... In, there's a focus on engagement over attendance. Yeah. In fact, if you focus on attendance, you'll get less attendance. But if you focus on engagement, you'll get more attendance. Mm. So is your church engagement focused rather than attendance focused? Yeah. Wow. Uh, it, there is a shift from compelling to versus invitational. Churches years ago were invitational. Then invite and marketing became the big thing. Well, there's a shift away from invitational. How crazy yeah. is that? Yeah. To more compelling. Yeah. Compelling, yeah. define compelling. Well, church, we should, people, your members of your church should sneeze your church. Yeah. Your church should be sneezable. <laughs> now, there's a new concept. <laughs> Basically, when someone comes to church, it should be so infectious, yeah. so compelling right. that they can't help yeah. but tell their friends and yeah. literally... Sneeze like, like, like it's viral. It's yeah. like it's like you yeah, have to come to church. Come this is like this is insane. Yeah. That and it's like that doesn't need marketing campaign. Yeah. It is so compelling that they invite, but it, it's right. natural. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. As I spat on the first row here, as well. <laughs> I'm still doing it. Number four, there's there's focus on leadership building culture over vision. In the 80s and 90s, vision was the big thing, but really what we're hearing now is the sound of culture. Culture. Now, it's a bit of a trend word, it's a very current word, I get that. But I'm telling you, if you, don't build, if you don't know what culture you're trying to build and then go and do it or know how to do it, you can have all the vision of the world and all the vision statements yeah. and the mission statements and the things written there, but, it, but unless the culture reflects that, it's going to be an ineffective church. Number five, leadership training is both theological as well as pragmatic. So solid theology, but good mm. praxis, good yeah. good. Practical things. And, and, and churches that lean too far in either direction will have an imbalance in the life of their church. Some of them are all, all theological, no practical. Some are all practical and not solid theology. We need, we, we need both. Okay, quickly, there is New Day churches are social media savvy. Yeah. Like insanely social media savvy. And I'm not talking, we've got an Instagram account. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm talking about... Savvy, wise, smart people, and, and you can, you can. Those things are not not important. Right. They're important. There's an emphasis from monocyte to multi-site. It doesn't have to be your church, but are you aware of that? Are you aware of the differences? There's a shift from monoculture to multicultural, uh, which is reflecting the nature of our cities, which is great. Yeah. There's a shift from reaching millennials to empowering millennials. If your church is trying to reach millennials, it's a generation behind. We've shifted to empowering millennials, which is important. And lastly, churches focusing on the basics again and not crowd-focused or event-focused. Hey, there's a few things. That's one of probably 100 things I could talk about. And just to finish on this is that what does New Day mean? Of course, Jesus in Mark chapter 2 talks about new wineskins. New wine requires new wineskins. Now, it's great to have new wine. What's, you know, new wine is new experience, new spirit, new mood. But without the new wine skin, which is new structures, new methods, the two work together. By the way, new wine doesn't come before new wine skins. Often we go, God, pour out your spirit, just pour it out. God's going, your structure, your wine skin is not going to cope with it. (laughs) Flow with what God is doing in terms of how he's doing it, and he'll pour out his spirit in that. So, and the two work together, which, which is a great thing. And so the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is this. So, so the question is, what do we need to see? The, the real question is, who do we need to see? Right. Yeah. I believe it's not what's next, it's who's next. Yeah. Who's next? Who's next? 
And so I believe we need to see several types of leaders. Several types of people, sorry, not several types of leaders. So right. who, who do we need to see? Number one, we need to see, have your, are your eyes open to leaders with new wine in them? There's new wine in certain people. You just talk to them and they've got a sound. They've got a way about them. And I, I'm attracted to this. But I'm like, there's, I can hear something. There's new wine in you. So you, we need to see them. Now, it's, it's wonderful to see and, and engage and connect with all sorts of people that have been around for long, a lot of years. Uh, and it doesn't have to be young people have new wine. Some older people have new wine in them. Take me, for example. <laughs> so... Can you see leaders with that new sound wow. in them? Secondly, can you see people once excluded from connection with the church? Wow. I believe each new generation is that we need to see people who are once excluded. It's interesting that, that Jesus, when he addressed the crowd, he addressed the Pharisees and the scribes, but then he also addressed the sinners and he mentioned specifically the tax collectors. Every generation has their tax collectors. Wow. Every generation has a group of people that were, ex- were never felt like they were welcome in the doors of the house of God. Wow. If we're not reaching our current tax collectors, we're not effective as a church. Wow. Our church needs to be filled with tax collectors. And you know I'm using that word yeah. metaphorically, of course. What, what are, well, your community will have, will have its own version of whatever that is. Yes. Thirdly, we need to see the next generation. And you might say, you might be sitting there going, I am the next generation. I see myself. But as, as young as you are, let me rephrase that, as, long as, you, as young as you think you are, you're not young. There's, there's young guys. I've got six grandkids. I'm looking at them and I'm hearing a sound. I'm hearing something in them. Do you realise that 90% of Gen Z live on YouTube. Wow. Live on it. 50% said they cannot live without it. Wow. <laughs> there is a different way of thinking. They have a different perspective on God. There's different ways of engaging communication-wise. Are we not just seeing the next generation? Are we knowing them, connecting with them, understanding yeah. them? Are we, are we empowering them and, and not judging them and, yeah. and saying, well, yeah, this is the next generation or whatever? No, it's awesome. It's, there's a shift. There's a change. We need to see that. And the last thing is that can you see the next tier of leaders who are inactivated? Wow. There, are, there are people in our church who are inactivated. Luke 15 talks about the lost um, sheep and at the end the lost son but in the middle the lost coin it's interesting the coin got lost in the house wow. and often people get saved and found to be then get lost in church yeah. wow. and much of the church is deactivated yeah. inactive we uh, the first harvest is in the activation of the church yeah. So can we, can we activate the church? Yeah. Can, can, can we see them? And we're often we go, you want to reach our city and community? Sitting in the pews are people who need to be found, yeah. who need to be engaged and activated. There's gifts, there's callings. And each one of those coins, back then, a bride would, as she grew, as a young girl would grow, she would get 10 coins and sew them to a headpiece. And then she'd wear that headpiece on her wedding day. And there are 10 coins. 10 is the number of completion. Nine is the number of man. And so when one coin is lost, when one life is deactivated from the calling and the purpose of God, the the, the mission of God is incomplete. I believe that part of our job is to find people in the pews and get them out of the pews. Well, not out of the pews. (laughs) Get get, get them activated into roles and teams and callings so the church becomes alive with, with activation. Which is great. So are we convinced about God's answer? Yes. Yes. That's a good answer. (laughs) And are we convinced that 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 answer is is the New Day version of that? That that, that, that it's God's perspective on the church. And if you're convinced about those two two things, the context of who you are as a leader, the future will be secure because you'll be building alongside of what God's focusing on, which is good. Hey, thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time.